That is why when people say, do you, we need this or this? My answer is yes. We need everything. Because if we do everything we can, as much as we can, without competition, not saying, oh, my solution is better or this solution is better, but just saying, yes, I support you, you support me, we'll do as much as we can, we know that we will be better off. I am a climate scientist. Uh, my background is in physics and atmospheric science. And specifically, I study the future. So I'm one of the people who looks at the future scenarios and then focuses very much on the local level to see what difference our choices make for our food, our water, our health, our infrastructure, our energy, and more. But the way I think about climate change is it's a symptom of a bigger problem. And I believe this is an important perspective because if you have a disease and you go to the doctor and they address your symptoms, but they don't address the cause of the problem, they're not going to ultimately fix the problem. And so with climate change, if we focus only on climate change as a problem, but we don't consider the root causes of this problem, then we're not going to come up with solutions that are sustainable. It will be as if we're putting a Band-Aid on a problem. So what is the root of the problem? The root of the problem is that for the entire history of human civilization, we have been living as if our planet were infinite. So we, we thought if we run out of something, there's always somewhere we can go to get more or someone that we can take it from. If we produce waste, there's always somewhere to put it where it doesn't matter. Now, we knew many years ago, even during the Roman Empire, they knew that waste was a problem and they had to address that in large cities. But they addressed it by just putting it elsewhere. We know that air pollution is a problem. The very first air pollution legislation was in 1300. It was in England, in the city of London, the air quality was getting so bad because they were burning sea coal within the city limits that the king legislated a ban against burning sea coal when he and the queen were in London. <laughs> <laughs> and the penalty was death. <laughs> so we have known that resource scarcity, that air pollution, that water pollution, um, that extinctions are a problem. We've known that for a long time, yet we continue to live as if our planet were infinite. And this problem was exacerbated by the fact that the field of economics that was developed relatively recently, back in the 1800s, the field of economics was created to focus only on what we could assign a monetary value for, and they did not put externalities into our economic model. So in other words, there was no value to what you can take from nature in terms of the loss that would be taken by cutting down those trees or destroying that watershed. There was no function within our economic system to account for that loss. And in fact, the people who benefited from cutting down the trees or destroying the watershed or overfishing or over farming, the people who financially benefited were not the same people who financially were harmed by it. And then on the other side, if you look at what comes out of our economic system, all of the waste, let's just think about air pollution. 10 million people a year die from breathing in the particulates from burning fossil fuels. What is the value of that? And that, why is that not in our economic system? Now, if any of you have read Kate Raworth, Donut Economics, okay, good, a few of you have. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. Now, you might say economics, that's not interesting, and I'm with you. When I was at <clears throat> university, the first um, economics, environmental economics class I took had very comfortable seats. And I only lasted three weeks in that class because I would fall asleep. It was so boring and the seats were so comfortable. But later when you realize that there's much more to it, for example, with a book like Donut Economics, you realize this is really important because this is addressing the root of the problem. We have to understand that we are living on a round planet with 8 billion people and we have to live in balance with the resources on our planet. That is what sustainable means. Sustainable means you can keep on going. That's what sustainable means. And the way we're living today, we cannot keep on going. If we look at pollution, if we look at the loss of nature and the biodiversity crisis, we are heading very quickly towards what scientists are calling a sixth extinction caused by humans. 
And then if you look at climate change, what is climate change? It is, and this is actually a term that comes from the US military, it is a threat multiplier. So it is taking our problems of economic inequity, pollution, loss of nature, poverty and hunger, disease, lack of education, lack of healthcare, the growing inequality that COVID even made worse. It's taking all of those problems and it's making them worse. And so climate change is almost like a lens that is, is bringing into focus all of the problems that we are confronting today. And if we don't fix climate change, we can't fix these other problems, but we need to fix the problems together. So we need solutions that not only put a Band-Aid on climate change, but also address the root issue of not appropriately valuing our waste or the products that go in, of not appropriately accounting for the role of nature in providing the clean air that we breathe and the water that we drink and the food that we eat and everything that we have. Often we live as if, and there's some people who think this, we live as if we think when we run out of resources in the earth, we'll just go somewhere else. And there's a few people who think that. But when they get to Mars, they will see <laughs> that there is no green space there. There is no easily accessible water there. Um, that is not plan B. In fact, as many people say, there is no planet B. So it's very interesting because um, five years ago, uh, before COVID, I was attending a science festival called Starmus. And it's a very interesting science festival. It's mostly astrophysicists, cosmologists, a lot of Nobel Prize winners. And Stephen Hawking was there giving one of his last talks before he passed away. And as you probably know, in his last days, he spoke out very strongly about the climate crisis. And so I was sitting there in the front row nodding as he spoke about the climate crisis. And then he said, and the climate crisis is so severe and so overwhelming that that is why we have to terraform Mars. And at that point, oh, no. I just thought, what? Do you not understand that if the solution to this problem is terraforming Mars, it will exacerbate all of the other issues we have because who's going to go to Mars? Is it the billion people who live off one or two francs a day who can't afford to feed their families? No, they won't get a ticket to Mars. When people go to Mars, will they take the same mindset with them of just using everything they can and not valuing the resources that are there? Of course they will. So I was absolutely astonished. And then I thought about it all, the, all day and then all that night. And then the next morning I was giving my talk. And I was giving my talk in a session with uh, Martin Rees, who is another very famous astronomer. He's the Royal Astronomer of England. And um, we were backstage and they were putting little pieces of tape on our computers because we had the same computer. So imagine if we got switched. <laughs> that would be very interesting. Um, and so I said, do you mind if I ask you a question? And he said, of course. And I said, do you agree with what Hawking said that, you know, to address the climate crisis, we have to terraform Mars? And he said, and I'm not going to do a British accent because I can't. <laughs> but he said, oh, Stephen and I are old friends. And of course, they're at the same college in Cambridge. So they know each other. And of course, you know, the colleges in Cambridge, you eat together every night. But he is so wrong. <laughs> Fixing climate change is a dawdle in the park compared to terraforming Mars. I was like, yes. <laughs> so rather, what that illustrates is, it, that story illustrates the dangers of believing that there's only one quick fix to climate change and that is more technology. Just go to Mars and all our problems will be solved. They won't be, we're just creating new problems. When we look at climate change, people are often so worried, and this is a bit where the psychology comes into it, we're so worried that one of our defense mechanisms, if we're very worried, is to identify one solution and say, this is it. If everybody did this one thing, everything would be fixed. And so I see this all the time. I see people who, who have decided that if everyone in the world became a vegan, that would fix the climate problem. Now, of course, we know that industrial meat production is a big source of methane and heat trapping gases. Of course, we know that plant-based diets are healthier for the planet. But we also know that even if everyone in the world went vegan, if they could, and many people cannot do that, they do not have the ability to do that, especially if they are living in low-income countries where their primary source of protein might be the ocean. 
Even if everybody did that, that would take care of this much of the problem. Then I often hear too from people who've decided that nuclear power will fix everything. So you don't have to change your lifestyle. You don't have to change anything. Nothing has to change. All we need is nuclear power. And I hear quite often from those people too. More subtly, I hear from people who say, well, technology is the only solution. If we just change the technology, nothing else has to change. Or maybe one piece of policy, there's just a certain policy. Now there's very good policies like putting a price on carbon, cap and trade. There's very good economic policies that help, but sometimes people put their faith in a single policy and they say, if we just do this, this will fix everything. When it comes to climate change, and when it comes to equitable and fair and sustainable solutions that address the symptoms, but also address the causes, there's no silver bullet. You know, sort of the Lone Ranger, one silver bullet fixes everything. That was from like a very long time ago. There's no silver bullet, but there's a lot of silver buckshot. So you sort of think of there's little, little pieces, but all the little pieces add up to a good solution. So if you saw the short talk I gave at the, um, at the symposium just two weeks ago, um, I mentioned there that I think of climate solutions as a swimming pool. Remember that? Okay. It's okay, there's no quiz. <laughs> I'll explain what I mean by that because it's kind of strange if you think about it. So if you imagine the swimming pool, and I'm thinking of an above ground swimming pool, I grew up with an above ground swimming pool in our backyard and it had just the right amount of water in it that my toes could just touch the ground and that's how I learned to swim. So if you picture an above ground swimming pool, that is the atmosphere. And the atmosphere had just the right amount of water in it, just the right amount of heat trapping gases in it, that our toes could just touch the ground. It was the perfect temperature for us, for our civilization. But then at the beginning of the industrial revolution, we stuck a giant hose in the pool and we've been turning the hose up every year and that hose is our greenhouse gas emissions. And during the first year of the pandemic, we turned the hose down 7% and then we turned it back up again. So what's the first type of climate solution we have to do? We have to turn off the hose. But the swimming pool also has a drain. And this is where you come in. The drain is a way to take the CO2 and the heat trapping gases out of the atmosphere once they're already in the atmosphere. And if we can make the drain bigger, we can actually take out some of the extra water that the hose put in. But then there's one more thing we have to do. The level of water in the pool is so high that our toes don't touch the ground. We have to adapt. Because everything we have, our buildings, our energy systems, our infrastructure, our agricultural systems, our water systems, even our human bodies, are perfectly adapted to a climate that no longer exists. Where you live today, you are experiencing the climate of somewhere that was significantly further south when you were born, within your lifetime. Yeah, exactly. In terms of the temperature, the plants, the seasons, the birds that you see. So I'm from Canada and I grew up every summer spending most of the summer up north at what we call the cottage. So in Canada, people have cottages. That means you have indoor plumbing. Our indoor plumbing was from like 1920. So it was a bathtub and one of those sinks that has like hot and cold. Cabin means you have outdoor plumbing. That's an outhouse. <laughs> so we had, a, we had a cottage and I got to spend most of the summer outside in nature. And so I know exactly what birds, what plants, what fish you see there because that's where I grew up and I saw them every day. And now when I go back, I'm saying, what are those birds? Or where are the mosquitoes? Oh, they already came out and died in June. That's not normal. Or where, where is this or where is that? Or it's so hot, nobody there has air conditioning either. And it's getting so hot now that some people, this is where people used to go in the summer to get away from the, the city heat. Some people are saying, I can't even do this anymore because it's too hot. So wherever we live, we're seeing these changes and we have to adapt. Because there was a study that just came out um, a few weeks ago showing that if we continue on our current pathway, a third of the world's population will live in places that, are, that will experience extreme heat so intense that it will be uninhabitable for humans. Our bodies will not be able to cool off in that heat. So all of the solutions we have, they fall into these three categories, turning off the hose, making the drain bigger, learning how to swim. 
And there's many different ways to do it because, for example, turning off the hose, people say, oh, clean energy, right? Yes, but also efficiency. We're very wasteful with our energy, even here and much more in North America. What about behavioral change? So we don't need to use as much energy. What about making the drain bigger? That's where we can talk about technology and about nature. Nature has huge potential to make the drain bigger in part because nature has been so under threat the last two, three, four hundred years. Because we have deforested such large areas of the planet, there's, large, there's great potential for reforestation. Because so many ecosystems are degraded, there's great potential to restore those ecosystems. Because we have been farming in such an unsustainable manner, there is a great potential to rethink our farming practices to be regenerative and sustainable. If you add up all of the things that we could do to bring nature back, it could take up up to a third of the carbon that we produce on an annual basis, which is huge. But of course, nature is finite because we live on a round planet. We don't have that infinite flat planet, so you can't just keep on restoring more ecosystems or you know, planting more trees or doing more climate smart agriculture. There is a limit to what we can do with nature. And we know, this is what the science says, and this is very important, there's no magic threshold for how much water in the pool is unsafe. Any increase puts more people at risk. So we know that the more CO2 we take out of the atmosphere, the bigger we make the drain, the faster we turn off the hose, the better off we'll all be. And so that is why when people say, do you, we need this or this? My answer is yes. We need everything. Because if we do everything we can, as much as we can, without competition, not saying, oh, my solution is better or this solution is better, but just saying, yes, I support you, you support me, we'll do as much as we can, we know that we will be better off. So that's my perspective on climate solutions. That's why I, as the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy, are here talking about technology like direct air capture, because I believe that by working together, we can accomplish more than we can working apart. And I know that there's so much potential. I know that there's so much that we can do. And I know that there's so many positive benefits to these solutions. So positive benefits, including jobs, including building a healthy and sustainable economy that is not based on extractive industries, but rather sustainable industries. With nature, when we restore nature, we clean up our air and our water. When we restore green spaces in cities, we help keep cities cool. When we uh, practice regenerative agriculture, we can provide habitat for biodiversity. There's so many different things that we can do and we can take carbon out of the atmosphere at the same time. And so with everything that we do, think about how is this helping with climate change, but then also think about how is this helping with the root issues? How is it making a difference for a truly sustainable planet? Because again, if we don't fix the root issues, we're never going to fix the symptoms that we're experiencing today. One other question I had for you was, sure. uh, since we are often confronted with a situation that we are in discussions, it could be friends, it could be at a conference, it could be in a podcast or whatever, mm -hmm. confronted with a question like, uh, okay, so this or that, like, which one are you favoring? And you're on this side, but there's the other option. What, do you have any, any way how you explain it to people that, that brings it together relatively easily, mm -hmm. like, that it clicks and so like, it makes sense? Mm -hmm. so just saying, well, one option would be to say, None of whatever we can imagine will do it on its own. It's just not the capacity just isn't there, right? So that's a reason for having an and. We need to add on top of that. Don't know whether that people find convincing or not, but sort of what is, what is the, your simple storyline to explain to people that the power of and is what we have to re-leverage here? I, I think it's, it's what I've said before, which is there's no one solution, but we need it all. With direct air capture specifically, I would usually add something that I know you probably do too. <laughs> and this is... <laughs> This is that, unfortunately, many people who don't want to change anything, they just want to keep on business as usual and put a Band-Aid on it, they say, oh, direct air capture. Keep on using fossil fuels and use direct air capture or use carbon capture and sequestration to take all the carbon out of the atmosphere. So I think often I have found bringing up people's objections myself and showing them that I'm conscious of those objections mm. often disarms it. So you can even say, you may have heard and then say da 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 da, but that is not the case. Direct air capture is important, but it will never take up all of the CO2 that we have produced. 
nor will nature take up all the CO2. We have to turn off the hose also, but then as we're turning off the hose, we need to take out all the carbon we can, and that is where we need all of these different solutions. So I think sort of bringing up the objections that you know they're going to have and addressing them is very disarming. Yeah, uh, you're very honest. Uh, you, this is among friends here, right? You, yeah. don't, you don't have to spare us criticism, but what, are you, what is your own view on direct air capture in the, as, as an element of this big picture where many other things are floating around? What role do you see for it? Where do you see its limitations? Kind of like if you have to sort it okay. into, into, the, into the large sequence of all the actions, where would you put direct air capture? Um, that's a great question. Um, it's, the, the way I think about it is on, on the tree of climate solutions, we have fruit that is lying on the ground that we just need to pick up, like efficiency. Just pick it up, it's lying there. Um, then we have low hanging fruit that's easy to reach. Many nature-based solutions, the acceleration of clean energy fall into the low hanging fruit. But then the higher up the tree we go, the more difficult and more expensive the reductions get. And so that is where direct air capture adds that extra little bit to help us reach some of those higher hanging fruit. Thank you very much. Excellent. Okay. Very good. Thank you.